What up, YouTube? It's, a, it's May 1st right now. It's a little bit. I'm going to say it's around like 10 o'clock right now. Uh, so, yeah, the chapter that I read is called um, The Conquest of Hymns. I'm outside, by the way, just to show y'all where I'm at. It's like the most solid tool spot that I can find so far. So in case a security car pull up, hey, it ain't my, it ain't my fault. Anyway, that's the chapter that I uh, read or whatnot, right? So in the beginning of the chapter, they say like... Um, uh, Abu Ubaidah chose a guy by the name of Milhan Ibn Zayar to march toward Hims, which would be their next destination. And this is after uh, Damascus was sieged and everything was finalized. So again, to me, that would make this like after September of 635. I'll go and look further into that later on. But anyway, um, so he chose for that guy to march ahead of him. And this this guy, Milhan, he has stopped at a place that they call Tai. And I couldn't find Tai on the map, but it's not that important anyway because from Tai, that's when he continued toward Hems. And when he got to Hems, he met Abu Ubaida there. Now, I want to make a note about this. The last chapter, when I brought up Balabak <coughs> toward the end of it, and I was saying, like, that's the last place that they mentioned as far as that chapter concerning Damascus. And I was like, I was like okay, they didn't give a specific date. Now I got an idea. Being that all of this, everything, uh, I don't want to say just northwest, but basically everything northwest, far northwest of Damascus, all that occurred after September of 635. So on his way of going to Hems, this is when he took Balabak. You know, which kind of makes sense. And I'm like, okay, that kind of justifies why he would want a commander. Because there's other commanders who people claim that he sent ahead of him. I'll get to them in a second. But I'm like, okay, that would make sense that he would send somebody ahead, especially if he got Balabak in mind. So anyway, they met there in him. When they got there, the people, based on this chapter, you know, they resisted. So that means like some type of fight happened. But in, a, in overall, the Muslims were victorious, obviously, because the people there agreed on terms with them. The Muslims told them that, you know, basically everything will be safe. Uh, the walls wouldn't, like the city wouldn't be demolished or anything like that. And that the people will have to pay 170,000 fucking diners. All right. Which I thought was interesting again, because, again, uh, the most that I ever, that I can recall, that was paid over to the Islamists was the people in Al Bahrain, Al Khatif, Al Khatif, and Al Qat, yeah, Al Khatif and uh, Al Hassan, which is south of Al Khatif. They had when everything was like collected, and accumulate, and, and everything was accumulated, culminated to about eighty thousand items that was sent to Medina, which I mentioned that was uh, interesting to me because they gave a consensus as far as to how many people live there amongst them that were now under Islamic rule because as a part of this stipulation, it was like, okay, war that stipulation, they had to pay a dino for every adult male or adult person, meaning those that did not convert. So that would be a form of taxes. So that's at least 80,000 people or at least around that amount that they did not, did not convert. So I thought that was interesting. It just brought me in the mind of that. But that's what they supposedly pay, 170,000 diners. Before I go into the second interpretation, I believe that that's more than likely the case. Not discarding everything after the fact, but as far as like uh, the people choosing to fight, the reason why I think that's more than likely is because of what I know about history. Number one, they did mention, before I go on, that... Um, when they met there in Taif and then they left, no, uh, no, nah, nah, I'm gonna leave it out. That's the second part. My bad. I think that's more than likely the case because Hems was a pretty big city. In other words, remember, like during the Battle of Ajnadain, all right, when Khalid fought there, you know, the fucking Emperor of Rome himself was was at Hems during that big battle, which included basically a hundred thousand fucking men, all right. He was there at Hems, and then when he heard that the Romans or the Greeks lost, he left. 
So I don't think he would just camp at an insignificant city during a time like that. That's number one. Number two, it brings me in mind of other places. I'm going to mention two, for example. Fast forward 800 years to 14th century. Thinking about Tagaza, as far as what Ibn Battuta said about those people in his book when he went through Negritia or the Sudan. And, you know, his description didn't point at anything really extravagant. I'm not going to go into all that again. But I'm saying, like, uh, Tagaza compared to a place like Hems would be equivalent to a fucking village. Or you go to southwestern Jordan. During this early period of, of the Islamic conquest, southwestern Jordan, the region of Aqaba, right? A place called Ela, right? Remember those people uh, during the chapter when they were talking about Tabuk and Makna and the Juham and all these other people, right? Uh, Remember, like, they had to pay, like, 300 diners every fucking year. That was that stipulation. Which means there are also a small population there. Not really that significant from a relative standpoint. So when you compare Ela and then the people of Tagaza, and you compare both of those to those of Hims, if this occurred at a place like Ela, I will understand why the people may not have uh, put up a fight. You know what I'm saying? That would make sense because they're they wouldn't equal in terms of probably numbers and you know uh, uh, people enlisted in the army there and population in general to other places such as fucking Hems. Same thing happened with Fadak. Same thing happened with Tang. You know, I wouldn't say Najran is that small, but the same thing happened with that chapter as well. You know what I'm saying? So, me personally, I believe that a fight. It fucking happened, all right? Second interpretation, which ties into that, is that, like, okay, instead of... <laughs> basically, it was another guy named Asimt, all right? That was a commander from Medina also. He was sent to Hems. Now, again, I'm going to draw a comparison. I'm just going to say he was sent ahead of Abu Ubaidah. You know what I mean? That's the second interpretation. So it's like he was sent ahead of him. But I'm going to add that either he was also along with Khalid and uh, Milhan Ibn Zayar, or it was just him over a command going ahead of Abu Ubaidah. whole point is, as they continued toward Hems, well, before they, you know, pushed out fully, when they got outside the city gate, this is what the chapter mentions, that supposedly uh, they had seen a group of Romans. Well, they said the enemy, so it has to be the Romans or the, or, 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 uh, 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 the Gossinid people. But they seen a group of them from a distance with horses. Now, let me add this. I think this city gate, even though they didn't highlight which one it was, being that this more than likely, more than likely is northwestern Damascus, I'm going to say the Bab al Jabaya gate. So they seen this group, and then they pushed out and they met this group at a place called Beit Lia. I looked up Beit Lia, didn't find it in Syria. I did find it in Palestine, but it was in Gaza, in northern Gaza. So more than likely, that's not it, which also means the name just has some type of uh, good meaning to it. You know what I'm saying? More than likely, like an Arabian word slash name that means something or a phrase or something. <coughs> but I didn't find it in Syria, but that's where they supposedly met these people at. <coughs> and... The Muslims took flight and basically chased them as far as hymns. <clears throat> this is the thing, though. Okay. They said they met there, and then the Muslims took flight and chased them to hymns. So that means some type of, to me in my mind again, that means some type of fight occurred. And the Muslims took flight, chased them to Sims. You know, I would say it sound like they lost, but I'm just going to go ahead and say, like, you know, it was just a, a, a little fight or whatever, and then the Romans are the ones that left, and the Muslims took flight, meaning they just left anyway and had to go to hymns, assuming that this is where the Romans also went to. Being that they, they met, and obviously, as far as the Greeks or the Romans, are aware that the Rashidun army is heading toward hymns, all right? So, uh, took flight, went to Hems, 
when the Muslims got there, they realized that uh, the Romans had left him, supposedly, according to this portion of the, the, the chat. Supposedly they had left hymns already. And being that they left, they left the people there unguarded. So the people were in fear. And then they say like, uh, this is so fucking funny to me because I'm like, this is a co serendipity for real. They said like, the people were in fear, but they also knew about what was going on as far as the Islamists and how great Khalid Ibn al-Walid fought, etc. So they just gave in and agreed to the terms. That little portion right there, I'm gonna say, I'm a, like I say, I don't agree with, but I just think it's funny because I'm like, damn, you know, it's a little validation. It's like, you know, going back to, you know, Fadak and all these other places as far as Yemen, uh, 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 Zabid, Adin, uh, uh, Al Janad, all these, everywhere that, where the people didn't fight at, you know, I, I, in those earlier chapters, I was like, in my mind, I'm like, okay, that makes sense because they heard about what was going on elsewhere and were in fear. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with the people of uh, Jaff al Yamama <laughs> and uh, Al Bahrain. I'm going to say Jaff al Yamama. Same thing with them. You know, they fear the retaliation, even though they initiated the fight. So other places, though, you know, I, I always say like they were afraid that added to them giving in and decided to, you know, some of them converting, others not just subjugating themselves under the Islamists. So when I read them, and when I read this chapter and I came across this portion, I'm like, okay, good, I'm on point with my thinking, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, that's what they said happened. But my thing is this, again, that doesn't, first off, it, and this is completely objective on my part, it paints the Romans or the Greeks, the Byzantinians, in like a cowardly picture, but I can understand why that exaggeration is there, because these are coming from Arabian sources, basically. Or you know what? I'm gonna make it more universal. Islamic sources. So it's gonna be a little bit of exaggeration there. That's that, that's all across the board, regardless. I always keep that in mind. So I can understand why they kind of made it seem like, you know, it's like they made uh, the Rashidun army and the people that went there in like a Superman-like image. You know what I'm saying? I can understand that. But anyway, so then a part of these disagreement between the people there and him and the Muslims was that it was a church called St. John there. All right, now one-fourth of the church the Muslims took left the other three-fourths or whatever to the Christians. The rest of the churches in the land or the city, they didn't put their hands on. They left that to the people. Also, the wells. Uh, let me make sure I'm not forgetting the wells. They said that they wouldn't demolish the city pretty much or destroy the city walls and all that type of stuff. So, that's that. Now, it's kind of like, okay, one interpretation is that this is all within the chapter. The person that made these terms was Ascent, Sempt, Ascent. Abu Ubaidah came along later on and uh, validated the terms. I'm not going to too much think too much into that because, I mean, it happened. You know, they, they, they took the city of Hems. Plus, this chapter is interesting, but it's not my favorite chapter so far. It's not really too, you know what I mean? Anyway, uh, so as Simps made the terms and Abu Ubeda finalized them, instead of it being the other way around as far as Abu Ubeda making the terms himself in the first place. So then, let me see, after that, uh, that's when another guy by the name of Yubal died, all right? He was a commander but um, Abu Ubaidah, after they got done with Hems, placed him as the governor over Hems. All right, and I also forgot to mention this as far as Damascus. Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan was placed as the governor over Damascus before this whole journey toward Hems. Let me just make sure I keep that in there. So Ubaidah was placed as the governor of the people of Hems, and then. Um, Abu Ubaidah 
continued going elsewhere, all right? So the next place that he went to was Hama. Now Hama is directly north of him in Syria. He went to Hama and then the people there had also capitulated and agreed upon terms with Abu Ubaidah and supposedly, well, they say in the book that, you know, that the stipulation was pretty much just the same as the people before them who were in next, which is those of Balabak. So he went to Hama, made terms with those people, and by the way, this is, yeah, this is, I, I forgot to mention Kara, another place called Kara. Uh, during this whole little, little, little journey as far as Abu Ubaidah himself going to him, his faction, Kara was one of the places that he passed through along the route to get to him. So I forgot to mention that. But yeah, so Hama, and then after Hama, he went as far as this place that they mentioned called uh, Zaara'a, and another one called um, uh, Al Al Kastal. So it was Zaara'a and Al Kastal. Think or Kastal. Only thing is, you know, that's it as far as those two places. You know, they didn't say like whether it was a fight that happened, whether they, you know, annexed those two places, whether the people there capitulated. They didn't say any fucking thing, so I'm just gonna presume that that's what happened. They went there, there was no real big fight that happened. The people just uh, capitulated and more, than, it probably wasn't really a big factor as far as like a big ass fucking place like Hems that would fight, you know what I'm saying? So they probably were a small population, not saying as small as those in Eli, but just not, wasn't gonna be formidable, you know what I'm saying? So those two places, and then after that, he went to uh, another place called Shazar. And then uh, from Shazar, he went to Famiya. Okay, all of these places are in Syria and really not that fucking far from Hams, by the way. Let me just throw that in there. So, for me, I, and I think that's it as far as that portion. I'll get back to that in a second if I forgot something else. So, then as the chapter goes along, they talk like they make a real leap forward and they talk about something else that I have to make a specific, like I have to you know, get creative again, I guess, and do some extra homework on that portion. When that time frame comes up and go back to it and then make a specific fucking blog chapter about that. So I'm going to skip that because it's not that relevant to this whole little time frame. I'm trying to keep this in chronological order. Chronological order. Orderly timeline shit. So then, let me see, that's it for that portion. Now, as far as uh, the governor of Hims, Yubada. Now, he continued his conquest, obviously under these orders, but he went south and he went to all these little coastal cities. Uh, one was Latikia, Latikia, all right? Now, see, the people there, for instance, you know, some type of fight did happen, but it was like guerrilla, it was, it was a guerrilla tactic that was employed. And I, I believe this is Yubada. I don't think this particular town was taken by Abu Yubada or solely by him at least, but Yubada. But the people there, this is what happened, okay? They had knowledge about what was going on in the region, right? So Yubada and them, from a nice little distance, decided to build these trenches, these holes deep enough to hide both men and horses in. When they dug this, by the time nighttime came, this is where they stayed at overnight. The people in Latikia thought that they had left and went back to him. So uh, they stayed there and then by sunrise, by the morning, when they opened the gates, or whatever, when they opened the gates, and then they came out with their cattle. That's when the Muslims met them and fought them, and then also entered through the city, thus conquering Lahikiya, and also came to came, or agreed upon terms 
with those people as well. Okay, so then like after that, then they went to another place called uh, Balda. Not too much is mentioned as far as them just being the next during this time frame. After Balda, they went to Antarctis and then annex the people there as well and also a fort called Jabala that's pretty much it now as far uh, and also uh, going back with real quick back to Abu Ubaida um, going back to Abu Ubaida Ibn uh, Jara Kinashrin <coughs> Kinashrin was another place that they had mentioned, but it was real brief. Only just not even, it was just like a sentence. That's it. They said like after this whole little conquest of hymns, hymns and Kinashrin were united as one, basically. The Muslims united both as one. That's all they said about them. But like further down, I'm going to say probably like three or four chapters, Kinashrin is a chapter by itself. So the book is going to go into a little bit more detail as far as uh, what happened when the Muslims went there. For now, they just kind of like briefly just mention it. You know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, that's it. Those are all the places. Now, if I'm forgetting anything else, hey, my bad. You know what I'm saying? Because I had to do this over and I don't like doing this shit over. But uh, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, let me see. Is there anything else that I did not mention that I may want to mention? I think I got, I got at least 90% of this shit. So, uh, see, I, talk, I touched on the 170,000 diner thing that I thought was interesting. Uh, I guess I'll go a little bit further as far as Balabak. You know, in the last chapter before this, the conquest of Damascus. <clears throat> at the very end of it, they brought up Balabak, or at least the very last portion of it. The, the, the end of the chapter. They brought up the Balabak and they were saying, again, how Abu Ubaida conquered those people. My question was exactly when. You know what I'm saying? And especially considering like the little stipulation that uh, they had for like the Greeks there. So I'm like, shit. As far as Balabak, I, I said 634 between. Um, Basically in August, we're gonna say August. That's the means. August, and then September of 6:35. I was like, between that whole little interval period, exactly when the fuck did they go to Balabak? You know what I'm saying? Now I know for sure, because I consider other things too, especially like the stipulation of thrown toward, you know, the Romans. Like if they were still there during the month of Rubai, I think. And I'm like, okay, that's more than likely the following year. After that point, then they would be subject to pay a land tax or whatnot. <coughs> and if they converted to Islam, then they'll just, you know, be under the same same stipulation as everybody else. Blah, 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 woo, woo. I was like, shit, when exactly did Balabak happen? You know what I mean? Because that would definitely, like, that little time frame, as far as the, 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 the stipulation that the, 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 the Romans would have to pay, that would definitely be after... Uh, September, I think I want to say. But anyway, the whole point is, when I read this chapter, I'm like, okay, now I understand. Being that the conquest of of Damascus was affected in September of 635, everything, as far as what I mentioned with this chapter, all those places, Shazar, Familia, uh, Hama, uh, 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 Ma'ara and Newman, as uh, 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 as all, all these fucking places. This is after September of 6:35. So logically speaking, that would make Balabak fit into that time frame as far as the content of the story. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Another thing is that's definitely after Fi, Basan, Tiberius. Uh, uh, Tra, fucking Al Jalin, uh, Amin, Al Jurash, or Al Jarush, uh, Ma'ab. That's like after all of those places as far as the timeline. Because those places that I just mentioned, all that, again, that's basically in 635. 
March at Sufar, that's another one. That happened in 635 also, but that was between February and March of that year. So, you know, everything else is, is as far as like Basan, Tiberius, and all of that, that Shura Bill Ibn Hassan went to, and, 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 and Yazid and them going to Amin. Anyway, all that is before March at Sufar which means everything in this chapter as far as the chronological order now that I got the dates and all that situated is after the fact right so that's it um like I said this chapter is not my fucking favorite because it's kind of it's not really you know it, it, it's not too much that I'm like oh okay you know it's just learning a little bit more as far as the history and the timeline but I did say okay they're getting closer to the point now that they're in the midst of this uh, holy war now and they're also into the second caliph. It's getting closer to the point where they're going to venture into North Africa as far as Egypt, the city Alexandria, that uh, Al Mukwar Kis presumably is still the fucking governor or Marsh Bond over it. No, 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 no. I don't know, I'm pretty sure that the, that, 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 that dynamic was somewhat different because it's either the assassin has got defeated in 633. This is after the fact. We'll see. Anyway, this is getting closer to the point to the point where they're going to enter North Africa. So, I, you know, I'm kind of interested in that. And they're going to go further into Turkey because Antioch is in southwestern Turkey. So it's not that far from uh, al Latikia in the first place. You see what I'm saying? So they're taking more and more land slowly. Uh, they going to mention the head of the Gossinists in the subsequent chapters to this because I kind of skimmed over them to see what they're talking about. So, uh, Jabala, Jabala Ibn Aham comes up. So, yeah, that's it so far. Uh, like I said, this is self-expression, documentation purposes, not necessarily to, to do nobody's fucking homework. You know what I'm saying? I'm just an inquisitive dude and... I've been doing this shit forever since a youngin, but I'm interested in this shit now. And I like uh I like the fact that aside from like the whole dynamic in Egypt, by the way, I like substantiation. Alright? I like being substantial. I don't wanna just talk and be like, this is what I think. I like to have facts to back up what the fuck I think. And you know, I like talking to other people too, they got their own shit, but you know, I don't do you know, I don't just throw words and shit like that out there. Anybody could do that. Anyway, yeah, aside from the whole thing about Egypt and, and, and Turkey and the Romans, I'm almost to the point where you get to Al Walid, right? The caliph in the early 8th century, right? That was, uh, the, he was the caliph when he went into Spain. And I'm like, okay, I'm getting to that point because I might go like maybe two or three caliphs after him. But no more further than that as far as like uh, when I get to that point in this book. Because I'm able to then transition that now that I have a sufficient amount of information and I'm getting to that deadline, I'm able to transition to the book that I was reading before this one in the first place, which is uh, The Travels of Ibn Battuta. When I was in Memphis, Tennessee, you know, I was copying a book online because, see, I'm going to give this out. I'm going to do this anyway. It don't matter. The website that I go to is called Archives. So all of these old books, they got the full fucking complete text text for free. And they do ask people to make donations. But that's where I go to get my shit from, by the way. I don't just do only Wikipedia. I'm not fucking quote nobody or none of that. This is my shit based off what I, what I think. But that book, uh, The Travels of Ibn Battuta, I got from that fucking website. And his whole little journey throughout the Sudan, I basically copied down. When I was in Memphis, I did my little two-part blog about that. And I think I still got that unveiled on YouTube, but I stopped at Abu Layton only because I figured maybe if I transition to another book, I could figure out why they, they seem, or he seemed to merge the Nile River with the Niger River. He mentioned both of them as interchangeable, basically. So I'm like, shit, after he leave Abu Layton, you know, you get a little confused when they talk about the places he went through in Mali, and then they mention certain towns that's nowhere in fucking West Africa, not even North Africa. So I was like, hold on. This is more than the fucking discrepancy. This shit is erroneous at this point. So maybe if I go read another book, you know, and they'll, you know, the language, just like, uh, just like Beit Liyah, for instance. 
I'm like, maybe, you know, I get a little bit more insight as far as the language. But not just incidentally, thankfully, I did choose to read this book, which is one of the oldest fucking books about Islamic history. You know, again, the 8th century. Because I got a whole bunch of fucking insight, and it brought me to so much interesting stuff that I had never heard about in my whole freaking life. You know what I'm saying? So, again, when I get to transition back to the other book, Ibn Battuta, and then read further and then figure everything out if I can't get, like, insight as far as certain language and words that they use and why the fuck they merge both of, the, both of these rivers together within the content, you know what I'm saying, within the language of the book. <coughs> uh, once I get done with that book, then I could go back to, I'm not going to say the real but this particular book is where a lot of people who write literature on this subject get their information from. Others as well, but this book right here is highly quoted. And it was written in the 16th century by a Moroccan. And it's called Tariq al-Sudan. When I read about the author of this book, I thought it was interesting. He seemed to have a lot of empathy. And he would... Well, I, anyway... When I get back to this book, when I get back to that book, I can't fucking wait because they also got that on this website called Archive. The only thing is, it's in another language. I think it's French. So you got to, well, I got a little technique that I do to translate the words. Yes, because I, I wrote like some, <laughs> I'm going to say like the first few paragraphs of the book, I already got those translated because I had started that when I was in Memphis. But that's when I was like, okay, let me transition to this other book, The Origins of the Islamic State first. But, you know, as far as, like, the beginning of it, I still got to translate it. So I got a little technique that I use. I'm not going give to that, give that away. To where, yeah, I got to copy this shit sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, section by section, portion by portion. And tedious, meticulously, really, translate that shit into English. That's how interested I am in history. So that's what I got to do when I go back to that book. Now, another reason why I chose to read that book is because, no disrespect, but I'm like, being that a lot of people get their information from that book and then they publish literature and, you know, put it out to the public or whatever, and then everybody else read the literature, I ain't hating on that. You know, so ain't nothing wrong with that. But I mean, myself, I fi figure, why not just go straight to the source? If this was one of the main sources that everybody go to, why not my, me, myself, go directly to that source and read it? I know how to fucking read. I'm not illiterate. You know what I'm saying? And thank God I chose to do this shit. Because just like even outside of this topic itself, like me taking that approach, you know, I can't. Oh, man. Like, all these places that I've been to so far with, with that, throughout the years, like uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Detroit, Michigan. I did go to South Dakota. I've been to North Carolina. I've been to New York. I've been to Philadelphia. I've been to... Um, uh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. And... Uh, Anyway, I've been to Philadelphia, can't even think right now, and a whole bunch of other places I'm not going to mention right now. But the whole thing is, every time I go to these different places, you know what I'm saying, I always find a time to go hit a library. Canada, too, by the way, let me mention that. Two provinces in Canada. I've been to Montreal, uh, Quebec, and Toronto, Ontario. Ontario. That was recent. That wasn't too long ago. That was uh, last year. And I came back in, like, November early November. But anyway, all these places I've been to, including Canada, I always hit them fucking libraries. I get, I find time to hit them libraries. And man, throughout the years, all across the board, just because of the approach that I take, I found out so many motherfucking uh, fascinating historical happenings in relics and all kind of shit that I had never heard about. You know what I'm saying? Some of it maybe a lot of it, no. Like when I was, okay, when I usually go to a library, I go to their reference section mostly. And when I go to the reference section, you know, most of it is like textbook type of stuff. So I take out their little textbooks, especially when I was in Detroit. 
and I was reading about all these artifacts and stuff like that. That I, you know, a lot of it I knew, uh, some of it I knew, I knew about even before this. But you know, it's just like a, just, I guess broadening my scope, right? You know, reading about this, I'm like, damn, human beings is doing this. Twenty, I don't want to say too much about it because those I want to do future vlogs about. So I, I already spewed a little bit too much. Especially what I'm about to mention as far as the YouTube blog that I got, a little small, little short conversation I had with somebody, with my uh, sister-in-law, you know what I'm saying? And I brought up this book called uh, Europe Before Rome. And again, everything else as far as the relics and all that type of stuff, I had read about even before this. But this book is like in addition to that. And it's really like a textbook. And I had came across that book a couple of years ago. You know what I'm saying? And they was talking about all these different, like, camp settlements. So that little blog that I just mentioned, it's called A Good Conversation. It's like a one in the part two. Part two is only, like, three minutes capturing, like, the last three minutes of the conversation. But within that blog, I had mentioned some of the facts I came across in this book. You know what I'm saying? Now, that has nothing to do with Islamic history. That's just history, period, going at least that far back. So, like I say, a whole bunch of stuff I'm not going to veil because... I like to document my thoughts and, stuff and things that I come across before I bring them up. That's also one of the reasons I recorded that little conversation that I had. But, uh, hell yeah, me taking this approach, man, I found out. You talking about seven wonders of the world? It's way more than that. A hell of a lot more than just seven fucking wonders of the Who the hell is this? Let me record these people. I don't know who they are, but they've been sitting there for a whole long ass time. But, uh, yeah, so I, me personally, I take that approach. But I do understand, like, you know, the middleman thing is because I could see, like me, for instance, right, before I started videotaping my thoughts and recording myself just talking regardless of what I'm doing in my life. Uh, I got these three essays in particular that I saved in my note section, right? And they're really fucking good. Two of them are really like, I like all three, but two of them I would consider I don't know if I want to make a measurement for the YouTube audience to understand I would say like two of them I consider diamond and then one of them kind of gold, you know what I'm saying? But the two that I consider diamond, that I will do video vlogs about I feel like this. When I was like weighing this in my mind, I'm like, okay. I could see the point of people that sell literature because it's like, okay, um, if I came across somebody, like a publisher or somebody, or somebody that did I let read those 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 uh, writings, and it was like, wow, this is pretty good. You know, you could put this in a book or what, what not. You know what I'm saying? It's original. A lot of what the fuck I said it's very, 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 very original, right? But it's also, it's kind of entertaining. It's edgy. And it's different. So I'm like, okay. If somebody came and they say, well, look, I could hook you up, right? I could facilitate this to where, like, you know, I could get you, I, you know, your stuff would be published or whatnot. And people might want to check it out and read it, blah, blah, blah. Then one will make money on that. But see, the knowledge base it came from me just thinking about stuff and having my own opinion, but as well as like reading facts about this and that. So then you got your facts, but then you got your thoughts, you got your comprehension, and you got what you think. So when you put it all together, it's basically my signature. You know what I'm saying? So being that I document this shit, if I decided to put that out, I would kind of be playing a middleman position myself. You know what I'm saying? Not necessarily me playing a middleman position, but like you had another person that said, you know what, I'd rather might check this out for myself and look into this. I can understand that. But my shit, what I put together is so different. You know, you can't necessarily find a replica. You know what I mean? That's why I say I'm not trying to shit on the middleman. Those who do read like Tariq Al Sudan or whatever like portion that these, these people maybe scholars at or what they teach teach at or just people that just like to learn about certain shit connoisseurs or whatever and they made it to the point where they could put out books and all that type of stuff i ain't mad at that you know what i'm saying i'm not arguing against that i'm just saying me myself i got a whole different approach so uh yeah that's it that's everything as far as this chapter i'm gonna go ahead and put this up and i'll holler at y'all 
during the next chapter, uh, the Battle of Ar or Al Yarmouk, which is kind of short, so I don't think it's going to take me like 39 minutes to talk about that. But again, let me show this. I don't know who the fuck this is sitting right there in that van. And I'll holler at y'all next time.